Hi, I'm Kerry Murphy from The Fabricant, and you're listening to the Tomorrow with Rovio podcast. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Tomorrow with Rovio podcast. I'm your host, Ben Mattis. Really interesting subject today, the future of digital fashion online. And digital fashion can mean a lot of things, but let's break it down. What is physical fashion? Well, it's the clothes you wear when you go out into the world. It's how you project your own self-image and the stories you want to tell to people you interact with, friends and strangers. And, you know, physical fashion has obviously functional elements to it as well. You know, keeps you warm and frankly keeps you modest. And there's something really interesting when we think about digital fashion, whereby a lot of those functional elements can and do sort of go away. You don't need to be warm when you're playing a video game uh, or when your avatar is playing a video game, not in the same way as, as in the physical world. And so digital fashion and sort of avatar self-expression opens up some really new opportunities in terms of um, the role that, for example, clothing plays on the avatar. And, you know, as I've explored this I've, over the past year or so, I've, I've talked to a variety of people who look at this in different ways. Obviously, this is something I've stayed interested in. And so when I became aware of this company called The Fabricant uh, and their focus on digital fashion and in particular digital fashion in the metaverse uh, with a Web3 component to it, I got really interested in reaching out, talking to the founder an ex-Finn named Kerry Murphy to understand a little bit more about the differences between digital and physical and sort of in particular this idea of, well, how are players of tomorrow going to think about their digital fashion? Are they going to think about it in the same way that they think about the clothes they wear every day? For example, are they going to change their clothes online every day or multiple times a day? Uh, and this is obviously a really important question because, you know, if someone buys a skin in Fortnite and then w wears that skin for six months, that's a very different experience than if they're taking off and on, you know, digital elements of clothing multiple times a day. Uh, obviously, it means a larger quote unquote wardrobe if they change their outfits many times a day. Um, but it also just means that self-expression is, is very different and how important it is to them is very different. So there's a lot of really interesting things to dig in there. So uh, please enjoy this interview today uh, with Carrie Murphy, founder and CEO of The Fabricant, uh, to understand a little bit more about digital fashion, user-generated content, player ownership, um, and where he sees all of this going in the future. Thanks so much. I hope you enjoy. Okay, well, uh, Kerry, thank you very much for being on, uh, on the podcast. We've had a, a couple of conversations in the past, and I've found them really interesting and insightful. So hopefully the listeners of this podcast will uh, will agree. Um, to start off, we'll, we'll start with a nice, easy softball. Can you introduce yourself? Uh, talk a little bit about your sort of career and what led to the founding of the company, the reason why I asked you to be on this show, uh, what you're doing at The Fabricant. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, super excited to be here. So uh, thanks for the invite. Uh, I'm a big fan of uh, Rovio. I'm, uh, I'm Finnish myself, or born and raised in Finland. Uh, fully Irish name, that's, that's my American side. Um, I, I left Finland uh, back in 1995 when I was uh, 13 years old. I've uh, been kind of like moving around, following my mom all around the world and then just settled in the Netherlands at some point and started doing film and visual effects. Uh, I was a big fan of uh, video cameras uh, in, in my youth. It was kind of that that time around 1997, 1998, when uh, consumer video cameras started to be much mm -hmm. more accessible, and I got one for uh, for my birthday, and I just started filming everything. I, I was terrible in school. I, I barely passed high school or <laughs> Anything, uh, but I, I definitely had one passion, and that was uh, creativity and media and storytelling, uh, especially kind of the storytelling side. It's a very broad term, uh, but I used uh, video cameras as my medium back in the days. And uh, when I went to film school, I really started excelling at school, really found my passion in that, um, and just uh, started a career in, in media, started a career in motion graphics a, a, after university. Uh, I studied in Australia, uh, film school over there. 
I wanted to stay in Australia and work in the film industry there, but uh, they didn't want to let me into the country. So after my uh, studies was gone, uh, they kicked me out. And then I went, went back to the Netherlands. My mom was still working there. Uh, that's where I got my first uh, media job. I was actually filming golf as my first job, which was uh, <laughs> ter- terrible. Uh, but golf is everywhere golf these days. Golf is massive. Uh, I didn't know how big of a sport it was. Uh, but yeah, I was, uh, golf is not the most exciting thing to be filming because it's the same thing over mm. and over again. Um, but that led me uh, into a motion graphics career where I started my own motion graphics company together with a friend of mine who was a graphic designer. And uh, I always had this like big hopes and dreams to really use motion graphics and and uh, filmmaking to kind of tell stories that create impact in the world. Uh, but, but what mm-hmm. happened very quickly, uh, you know, of course, as a creative, you need money. And wh- where is the money? Well, it's in the it's in the advertising in- industry. It's in, with the mm-hmm. creative agencies themselves. Uh, so moving into Amsterdam, I you know got to kind of like into, into the expat circles, which led me to work with. Uh, agencies like Wyden and Kennedy, 72 and Sunny, 180 Amsterdam. These are like big creative agencies from the United States, uh, working with clients like Nike, Adidas, PlayStation, Facebook, Google, like all, all the big names that you can really imagine. But it always missed something for me, which was kind of like truly creating impact, something that was always inherent to everything that I wanted to do, use storytelling to create positive impact in the world. So... I did a leadership school uh, in 2015 in Amsterdam, uh, where I learned a lot about, you know, like uh, leadership, uh, impact, and how, how do you really use an organizational power to create positive impact in the world. And uh, I was totally confused after this leadership course. I was really like, I love what I do, but I miss that impact side of things. Um, but somehow one thing led to the next, which was very serendipitous. Um, there was cloth simulation started to be a thing back in uh, 2015, mm-hmm. 2016. Uh, I think it was really a marvelous designer, this software that a lot of gaming companies, a lot of visual effects companies use for cloth simulation these days. became quite ac- accessible and uh, very, very good results when it came to something that was super difficult to do in, in the kind of the movie and film visual effects industry. And once I discovered uh, Marvelous Designer, it, it led me into a path to start talking to fashion designers because I wanted to get some proper fashion into Marvelous Designer. And then when, when starting to talk to uh, fashion designers, you know, I noticed that they're super passionate, uh, that they you know have a lot of issues in the industry, especially when we talk about environmental issues, when we talk about cultural issues, uh, socio-political challenges. There was just a lot of challenges in the fashion industry, uh, and it was not digital at all. If you looked at mm-hmm. any other design industry at that point, they've gone through complete digital transformation. Just, yeah, all of them. You know, just name one design industry that's not digital. Well, it's it at the moment it's just fashion. Um, so it was quite easy to predict that, that fashion was going to go through digital transformation. Um, wasn't sure about the timings, didn't know when it was going to start happening. But when speaking with fashion brands, it was quite clear that they needed digitization. They really needed to uh, transform a lot of their processes, especially when it came down to sampling. So sampling is when they have like the first sample of the, let's say, the sweater that I'm wearing uh, and they need to put it together. Typically, they send the sketches to a factory, you know, most likely in China. The, the Chinese factory will put the sweater together, send it back over to Europe. Uh, they will put some post-it notes on the sample and send it back to China. And this process is like six weeks long before they even have a garment ready. Just think about it. It's just like to me in this day and age of 2016, when everything is so digital, that's like the most manual thing that you can think of. It's all post-it notes and FedEx. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's, it's it, it, it's mind-blowing at, at that moment when when the whole world is going digital, but that they were still there. So it was very easy to see the direction that I was going towards to. But I didn't want to just do sampling or, you know, just 3D renders of physical clothing. You know, that's not creative. I'm also a creative person. I'm, I'm a storyteller. Um, so together with my uh, co-founder, uh, Amber Sloten, who's a digital-only fashion designer, and she, and she made a very clear stance to only design digital clothing in 2014, 
when there was this huge drama in Bangladesh, I think it was called the Magna Raza building uh, that collapsed where more than 1,000 people mm -hmm. working in the fashion industry died. And these were uh, fashion workers working for companies like H&M and other, other uh, fast fashion companies. And she just said, like, well, I do not want to contribute to this world. And that really inspired me. And me and her, like, we creatively clicked very well. And I had the technical knowledge. She had the fashion knowledge. So we started working together and just just spitballing ideas. And we just came up with the idea of digital fashion house. Why not? It's like it didn't exist at that point. So it's exciting. And at the same time, future proof, because you know this whole industry is going to digitize. So we started a digital fashion house in 2016. But it took us two years before we could actually truly start to be 100% uh, business and 100% focused, mm -hmm. you know, to really tie that business model into it. Because we had the technical side down, we had the creative side down. Only thing we needed to figure out, how are we going to monetize this? How are we going to make a business out mm -hmm. of this? And the gaming industry was one chance, but like all the doors were locked to the gaming industry. And also from a technical standpoint of what we were trying to do, which was high fashion, typically, you know, like games don't do that. You know, they do quite simple mm -hmm. t-shirts and shorts and or like bomber jackets, jeans. Those were like always the typical requests. But we're like, we're doing high fashion and, you know, these are like extremely heavy files. So it's very tip. Uh, difficult to do it for gaming. Uh, so we started working with fashion because that's where the excitement was. That's where the need was. That's where people were willing to pay for our services, which was to create high quality visualizations of clothing that they wanted to sell physically. And so that's how we got started in 2018. Okay. And sorry, I mean, I recognize that you're more on the technical side of things. Um, and your, your co-founder was more on the fashion Correct. side of things. But given that the Fabricant is a digital fashion house, I think you've probably gotten a bit of a crash course, right, in fashion Absolutely. over the Absolutely. years, particularly how fashion exists, shall we say, yesterday, right? What I mean is up until this, this digital transformation that's probably, we're probably right in the middle of that's probably taking place. Can you talk a little bit more about the, the fashion industry as a whole, like, so obviously there's the manufacturing side of Correct. it that you guys initially sought out to disrupt, right? Like, which is the forget the post-it notes and the FedEx boxes kind mm -hmm. of things. But what else happens inside the fashion industry that, that you guys think you had an opportunity to change because of digital? Can you talk a little bit more about some of the things that you think the fabricant was ripely positioned to disrupt beyond simply the um, the back and forth between European fashion houses and the Chinese manufacturer? Absolutely. And uh, yeah, great question. Um, I, I think I can talk hours about this topic. Um, I'll, 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 try to, I'll try to break it down. And I always like to use uh, real real world examples and be like, okay, how, how are we creating this new reality to it? So if you think about the fashion industry, uh, the, the, the starting point in the fashion industry is material creation. So cotton farming or make, making yep. polyester, making yep. threads. And the end is uh, recycling or upselling, uh, upcycling, uh, th those type of things and everything in between. You know, So we really look at the fashion industry as a whole and see where does digital fashion play the biggest role? Because it, actually, even though it's digital fashion, it's completely different from physical fashion. Now, where, where we are disrupting the most, I would say it's really from the cultural side of things. It's really from the, oh, from the identity side of things. You know? So what, what we're creating right now, we call it the so-called wardrobe experience. Uh, you, know, you, you buy digital clothing and you can wear it in your metaverse life. But again, what's the difference here to physical fashion? Well, you, you're not wearing it. It doesn't keep you warm. But it's really focused, again, that word storytelling. It's your identity. How, how do you want to create your identity in the metaverse? That's one of the biggest questions. And we're true believers that everybody wants to tell their unique stories. Everybody wants to show themselves in one unique way in, in, in the world itself. So that's, that's where we're truly focused on. And then if you think about like fashion weeks, uh, the runway show, uh, and you think about there's a creative director who's kind of like the lone wolf uh, hero of the whole fashion brand. 
Then you have the runway models, you have the stylists, uh, you have this whole crazy culture around the fashion weeks and, and the runway show. And there's like all these people from all around the world are flying to, let's say, Paris to go through this 15 minute show where they get this kind of like exclusive curated experience where uh, they're really just catered for. So they buy as much clothing as possible to go back to their own countries and sell that clothing. I think that that culture itself, um, it's it, well, at least it's not for me. You know, some people love that, but mm-hmm. it, it's it's not it's not inclusive. It's not democratic. It's mm-hmm. not something that the whole world can take part in. And we're actually saying, well, di- with digital only fashion, not only can you be the digital fashion designer, but you can also be the digital uh, model. You ca- you can be catwalking your own digital fashion shows. You can be the creative director. You can be the stylist. We're really opening up all these tools to the world where everybody can partake in the fashion narrative. And I and I always love using the example of what the smartphone did for uh, photography and videography, not also for graphic design and motion design. Uh, the smartphone made everybody a, a content maker. All of a sudden, everybody mm-hmm. could be a photographer and a videographer. And then you started getting platforms like Instagram, where you can actually distribute your photos. You're distributing your stories. Uh, YouTube, where you know twelve-year-old kids are creating content, getting millions and millions of views. This is what what I call is you know so-called democratization of the of the of the video and photography industries. And you saw all the disruption that happened there. Um, I, I have mm-hmm. a film and visual effects uh, education, and uh, you know went to school to that for more than four years, and you know did a lot of work work for it, learning all these tools, you know, cameras and editing and After Effects. And, and now ter- kids on TikTok. <laughs> oh my God, just think about that, how, how people might feel when, you know, the, the, when they talk about the craftsmanship of, you know, video production and then some kid comes there with their smartphone and it's just getting millions more views than all these other, let's say, so-called professional ones. So what, what it showed is that, the, again, the storytelling is way more important than any kind of like button pressing, like knowing the right buttons to press or making, you know, super cool movies. So like what we see, like amazing visual effects movies, but the story is lacking. Mm-hmm. You know, pe- people yep. notice that uh, very, very quickly. It's the same thing's going to happen with fashion. So, okay, you, you've said storytelling a bunch. We've talked about physical versus digital a bunch. Um, I'd love, assume... Like in order to ask this question, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you to pretend that I know, you know, nothing at all about fashion. I mean, perhaps you can tell from my shirt. Uh-huh. I'm not exactly king fashion plate. I probably spent 50 bucks on this shirt from H&M or something uh-huh. like that. Uh, may, actually, I think this was Frank and Oak, um, a step above H&M. Uh-huh. Um, but talk to me a little bit more about this idea of storytelling. So, you know, what someone who loves physical fashion, right? When, when they get dressed in the morning, what's going through their head, do you think, as, as someone in this industry? What, what is the story that they're looking to tell? And what are the parallels between that and digital? And again, there's, there's something here I'm, 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 I'm fishing for, um, which is one of the major differences that I see personally between physical and digital. I'm trying to kind of nudge the conversation in that direction, but let, let me start with this question about like, what is this story? Like, what does a great outfit say? What's the story you're telling when you put together a really, really compelling outfit in, in, in the physical world, for example? Again, great question. And I, I have this conversation uh, a lot with the fashion designers within the fabricant, you know, so, we're a company of about 50 people and we, we have uh, 10 traditionally educated fashion designers who all love fashion. And I, and I try to also understand the, the difference between them and myself because, you know, I'm, today I'm wearing a black hoodie. And it's very functional. It's, it's very comfortable. It really matches the, the weather outside. But for, for somebody who truly loves fashion, they're not thinking about so much, oh, what's the weather outside? They're really mm-hmm, thinking mm-hmm. about how do I create my identity today? You know, how, how does this clothing make me feel? They're really 
in touch with that emotion that clothing actually is an emotional resonance for them. They really want to play with their identity. They use this term uh, gender fluid all the time because mm-hmm. they don't see identity as you know something that is just like you know uh, a stagnant or rigid. It, 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 it's not like just one thing. Your identity is much richer than that. And they're constantly just seeing, you know, like how, how does you know this make me feel different? And they're not shy to wear guys' clothing. They're not shy to wear, you know, uh, women's clothing. They're not shy to really just try different things to see mm. truly how does it make them feel. And this is actually a great call to action with a, with a lot of the people who are listening to this and don't think of themselves as fashionistas. I would say, just see what happens when you put on different clothing that you I, otherwise you would not put. The first reaction always is, it's slightly uncomfortable. It's slightly like, oh, what would people think about me when I go to the street? How, how do other people uh, see me? But then really think about, how, how, how does it make you feel? And this is something that I've learned in my journey in this fashion industry since 2016 to really start seeing myself as much more than a heterosexual white male from Finland. Uh, but really start thinking of like, okay, I'm, I'm so much more than that. What else can I be and how can I use clothing to, to get that out of me? And something that's happened to me in digital fashion, uh, this was already when, when I started uh, working with Amber very, very early on, I, I had a 3D scan of myself and I gave that 3D mm-hmm. scan to Amber. I'm like, Amber, can you just put some clothing on my, on my 3D scan? I, I didn't care what it was and I didn't think too much about it either. But then she put something on me that I was just kind of like, ew, I, I wouldn't wear that in my, in my physical existence. But then when I saw it kind of in a safe space from a you know, third person perspective, I'm like, oh, hey, I look like that. Hey, that's quite interesting. Why wouldn't I try that? Why wouldn't I pl- try mm-hmm. to play around with that? And that's when I started noticing that, yeah, my identity can be much more than what I've thought it would be much, much earlier. And then what started happening, I got, you know, crazier and crazier fashion designers to start putting like bubble clothing on me and just like really weird, more like fantastical stuff. And you really start thinking of yourself, you know, much more from a storytelling perspective of like, hey, why not? Why wouldn't I put that thing on myself just to just to try something else out? And again, it it you kind of start noticing from yourself of like all these limitations that we put on ourselves and it really does come from probably from young age you know especially uh you know for us who's been around for a little bit longer than the young generation where we just kind of thought like okay when men you have to wear blue mm-hmm. you have to wear this shirt you know you you have to wear this and it just it just becomes very normal so this is a great one for you as well ben just like try something different You know, just try. Oh my God, I'm not brave enough. <laughs> yeah, but where does that come from? <laughs> like, it's so weird, right? That's it's a great question, but I I don't have the most um, adventuresome uh, style in the real world. I I totally hear what you're saying. I do think I could allow myself to be way more um, adventuresome and way more flexible with my style choices hmm. in in a digital world, even if even if it was a one-to-one replicant of my, like a digital twin, right? Mm-hmm. Even, even if the avatar looked exactly like me, if it was in a digital world, put me in a dress, put me in a bubble helmet, put give me wings, no problem. Yeah, right. I'd love it. I'd love to have that safety net. But if you asked me to wear that down the street in the real world tomorrow or come to the office wearing that, I, I think I would struggle. And it's probably just ingrained in, you know, society and how I grew up and what clothing was and the functional requirements of clothing in the real world and all those sorts of things. But I I do think I would be way more comfortable exploring in a digital than in a physical yeah, form. Absolutely. absolutely. And that, that's what happened for me. And that, that's where I still am. And I've, I've gotten peace with that. I'm like, I, I, okay. don't, I don't need to be this extravagant person, you know, wearing crazy stuff in my real life. I can actually be You know, this super basic bro who just wears T-shirts and jeans, as long as I feel comfortable mm-hmm. with that. And this is another conversation that I have quite a lot within the fabricant. What's the difference between a fashionista and a fashion victim? What is a fashion mm-hmm. victim? And we, we came to the conclusion that a fashion victim 
is somebody who puts on all these clothing thinking that it's the right thing to do, thinking that, hey, this is how I want to present myself to the world, but feeling like super, super awkward, not feeling like, like that the clothing does not empower you, but it makes you feel more insecure. And the, the, where we noticed this the first time, we were hanging around Paris Fashion Week and there's all these like, you know, a lot of shows going on, but there's all these kind of like people coming there who want to be seen wearing like, you know, $2,000 worth uh, Louis Vuitton shoes, uh, wearing Balenciaga mm -hmm. bags, wearing Gucci shirts. And they're so awkwardly standing there, just, you know, just hoping to be seen or like that they, they want something. And I don't know exactly what it is, but you just notice, oh, that's a fashion victim. But then you have somebody who's mm -hmm. just sitting there, you know, just, you know, wearing nothing out of the ordinary, but just really has this kind of radiant energy of confidence on them. That's a fashionista. And if you can do that with a white T-shirt and shorts, you go for it. You know, who, who mm -hmm. is anybody else to come and tell you what you should wear and what not to wear? Only thing that clothing needs to do for you, it needs to make you a better version of you that day. So the shirt that you're wearing right now, Ben, if, if that empowers you, if that makes you feel super confident coming to, coming to work, then you're a fashionista. It doesn't matter what it is, whether it's Frank and Oak or Balenciaga, as long as you're owning it and it's making you proud and you're like, guys, I am, I am, I am a fashionist. There you go. There you go. I think you're probably the first person in my entire life who's ever called me a fashionista. <laughs> I have to tell my wife when I get home today, oh, Carrie says I'm a fashionista. Yeah, so, yeah you know. but you have to own it. Now, you have to have the confidence to be able to do that. And that's not always easy. I'll do a, I'll do a, I'll do a strut afterwards. Good luck. <laughs> um, I want to say, I want to talk about today. You, you've said today time and time again, and this is one of the places where I see a, a relatively strong difference between physical and digital in its current state. I change every item of clothing in the real world every day, occasionally multiple times a day. Like if I go exercise or if I spill something on my shirt or whatnot. Um, my daughter is heavy into Roblox, even you know, a game like Roblox that is really strongly focused on self-expression and individualization. She certainly doesn't change her avatar's appearance daily. I mean, maybe weekly, maybe. Uh, and, and, and she's like deep into that mm -hmm. sort of self-expression or, or the power of Roblox to be a vehicle for self-expression. If you have a game like, say, Fortnite or whatever, in terms of skin changing, I mean, it's probably once a season, maybe a few times a season. Uh, you know, it, it, it's certainly not daily. And so can you talk to me a little bit about that? Like how, how much is that an opportunity and how much is that a problem that we don't change our clothes digitally daily? Mm, yeah, great question. Then. Um, we, we talk about it from the opposite perspective because the true value of digital is that you can actually be changing your clothes all the time. The, you know, every five minutes you can have a different outfit. Absolutely. Yeah, to it could be constantly shifting. Const it, could be a, it could be a digital billboard that's changing its texture palettes every five seconds exactly. if you want it. That, that, that's the true power of it. So I'm, I'm a, l a little bit surprised to hear that, you know, they're not, they're not really changing it. But I guess it's part of the experience then. You know, the question there is like, okay, why are they not changing it? You know, is the experience not changing? Are they doing the exact same thing? Or are they just feeling super comfortable with it? Or are you not giving them money to buy more clothing? Is that what you're doing then? Mm. Um, you know, so th there's a lot of different aspects to that. Um, but really focusing on the power. And I think the, the, the word experience is super important here. What is the experience that we're catering for? Now, let's use Fortnite as an example. Fortnite, you know, typically a, a shooting game, uh, you know, Battle Royale. But then you've had a few, uh, what do you call, um, uh, events, festivals. Uh, you know, you had the Marshmallow mm -hmm. Festival. You had, uh, what's his name? Tra Travis Scott. Travis yeah. Scott. Travis Scott. You know, fantastic experiences. The question is like, would, would you show up in different clothing to those experiences? Or does it not matter? And another question is like, you know, who is it? You know, some people will care about that stuff and some people won't. Some people will, will want to have an infinite wardrobe where they can just constantly be choosing stuff and others will, will not. Uh, another example is um, avatar configurators for games. I actually know quite a lot of people who love the an avatar configurator much more than the game itself. Uh, typically, let's say, mm -hmm. 
from a couple, the girlfriend will say like, well, hey, I, I want to create the avatar so the guy can uh, play the game. And, you know, they sometimes they go up to 30 minutes just really playing with the avatar creators. Like some of the best uh, avatar configurators that I've seen, uh, Red Dead Redemption, uh, Cyberpunk 2077, you know, they've really gamified that experience, you know, where, where it's a lot of fun. Now, if all of a sudden you have that same thing for clothing, that you have a, a clothing configurator where you can feel like you are the creative director of making that clothing, where you can choose, uh, you know, the buttons, you can choose the s- stitches, or the type of seams, the type of materials, uh, pocket placement, uh, where, where you where you have a tool that's so powerful that makes you feel like a creative. I think people will care a lot more about it because. Um, I don't know so much about ro- Roblox, but I do know in Fortnite that you know you're just choosing a skin, but it's a pre-made one. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's it's not it's mm-hmm. not so creative, right? You're just kind of like, okay, well, mm-hmm. hey, that's yellow. I like yellow, so I'm going to choose that. And then mm-hmm. you know, then you're going to keep playing with it because it's the only yellow item in the game. So again, that that word experience has to come back. When we create the experience, people will care. Okay, and so I'd like to then talk a little bit about uniqueness. Uh, okay. So here's a different game. Well, a, a guest I had on a couple of the last guest I had on the podcast was from, uh, Naver Z. So they, they make a game called Zepetto. Zepetto's an easy claim to be in, a, you know, a functional metaverse or a, a metaverse in development, depending on how you want to look at it. Um, you know, they have avatars, they have virtual persistent worlds. You can create Clothing, you can sell clothing. They've got a digital ownership component to it. It's a really interesting product. And there are people who are, you know, digital designers inside of Zepetto. They're, they're, they're making and selling clothing. And there are a few instances of people, you know, making very real money, you know, doing so. And one of the really interesting things about it is if I make a, a shirt in Zepetto, I, I put it on the marketplace and it then becomes, um, a brand. It becomes a clothing line where infinite of these things can be bought, right? So in the world of fashion and, and the storytelling component of fashion, how important do you think, I don't want to say exclusivity, but, but, but the limited nature of things, how important is that, right? Your example before about like the white t-shirt and the shorts, like if you're, you know, if you're wearing it with confidence and you're a fashionista, if you're sitting beside 15 other people dressed exactly the same, they're all wearing exactly the white t- same white t-shirt and exactly the same shorts, and they're all sitting side by side and all of them are exuding confidence, they're all fashionistas according to your definition does the story somehow get weakened a little bit by the fact that we're all aesthetically exactly the same? Like how, I'm, just talk to me a little bit about where the world of uniqueness or limited edition fits into this, your philosophy about fashion as a vehicle for, for narrative. I, I love that visual. I, thinking of this like 15 dudes sitting right next to each other wearing the same white t-shirt and the shorts. Same white t-shirt and the same shorts, I, all exuding confidence, yeah. all of them with a story to tell. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's, it's a great point. It would, it would probably dilute the fashionista side of it uh, quite a lot. So uniqueness, of course, is, is very important. You know, like we, we, we see this in all aspects of our life that you, you do want to be unique. You do want to have a unique story. And if, if clothing is a, a tool for storytelling, you do want to tell a different story from somebody else. Um, I, th- I think the instances that we do want to wear the same clothing as the next person is within communities. Uh, it's within um, uh, sports communities. Uh, it's with, uh, yeah, wh- what else? You know, like uh, uh, gaming, you see? Music communities. Music, or, yeah, yeah sure. exactly. When, when you do want to sell, tell the same story and say, hey, I'm part of the same group as this other person, those are the times that you do want to uh, tell the same story, but other times you do think like, okay, how 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 do I want to tell the a, a different story? You know, like it's it, it's the same thing probably for you. Like if you come to the office today and you see one of your colleagues wearing the same shirt as you, you know, it's a it's a little bit of like, yeah, how, how does that make you feel uh, that that you're wearing the same? It probably doesn't empower you. Probably unless it's a really good friend and you you know you high five each other like wow so we're so aligned. Who wore it better? <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's just like it depends. It depends who you want to be affiliated with. If I if I go to a restaurant and I see somebody wearing you know the same stuff as I'm wearing, 
I do feel like a little bit weird. And then I'm like, well, I should buy something else. I should buy something more unique. So I don't look like this other person because I'm, I'm a different person. I want to differentiate myself. Mm -hmm. And again, that's like one of the, the values of the, of the metaverse or our virtual lives is that you can curate your virtual life much more uh, than other people. You know, and you already see mm -hmm. it in the uh, in the PFP projects in the in the Web three space. You already see it on you know, your Instagram profile picture, your LinkedIn profile picture. Everybody's constantly you know showing different stories by you know just putting different media there. So I I think uniqueness is very important unless you want to tell that very specific narrative that you fit in into this community itself. And right. the first time we spoke, I remember I very much remember this. You were wearing a red uh sip up sweater hoodie. from Rovio. Yeah. Yeah. You know that's what my Angry Birds hoodie. Exactly. And that it's in the wash today. That, that was the story that that you told. And you know it it shows like hey, I'm I'm a proud member of the Angry Birds Rovio community. I that's how I want to show myself today. And it was probably a you know super comfortable sweater as well that does kind of fit. It's a great hoodie. Yeah, I, I bet it is. Um, it's interesting. It also there's probably some sort of like hierarchy in terms of clothing items from a uniqueness point of view. How important they are. Like I probably am wearing the same pants as at least two other people <laughs> in this office, if not exactly the same brand, the same color. Um, and you know, I, my running shoes, like, you know, sneaker heads probably look to shoes first, right? That's probably the first thing they look at and they want to make sure they have a pair of shoes, you know, a pair of kicks that like differentiates themselves from everyone else in the room. Um, you know, some people probably look at the hat, right? I think my eyes are probably naturally drawn towards the shirt, right? As a, as a not, maybe not the most sophisticated fashion connoisseur in the world, that's the thing that catches my attention first, is what's the shirt that someone's wearing. And if I see differentiation there, but similarities at the pant level, it doesn't make a bit, it's not a huge deal, right? At least the shirt's different. If the whole outfit is the same, that's when I start to go, okay, is, what's going on here? Are these guys, are they trying to dress the same? Um, and that kind of speaks to your point about communities, right? Like if I were to walk into the office and everyone was intentionally dressed the same, I would assume there's a story behind that. Like, why did they intentionally mm. wear every item of clothing the same? Good point. Can I, can I also, um, can I, but can you, I, you mentioned, you mentioned communities. Um, I could dig in a little bit on that one. Uh, and was there something you wanted to, I, to play back where you, you trying to inject another point? I just want, I just wanted to add a, a, a personal story of, uh, again, Please. Of, of what happened to me uh, very early on. So the first project that we got with the fabricant was uh, working together with some uh, luxury fashion brands. And we, against our own will, we got a lot of the clothing uh, shipped to our studio because that's what fashion industry does. It just ships clothing uh, throughout the world, you know, from one person to the next. Um, so we got all this uh, clothing shipped to us, all like high-end luxury wear, and it was, it, yeah, it's super cool, and you see the craftsmanship of it. And one of them was a, a black sweater from Off-White, I, and I wear a lot of black sweaters. And this was at our previous studio, and there was a coffee shop right around the corner from my studio that I went to every single day. And there was this guy working there, like he made great coffee, but he never said a word to me. You know, he just made the coffee and you mm -hmm. know gave it to me. But that one day... I went in there with this off-white sweater with a big off-white logo on, on the chest. And off-white, off if you don't know, it's a, it's a brand by Virtual Abloh, who was the uh, creative director for uh, menswear Louis Vuitton. He just passed away uh, recently, just last year. Uh, very famous uh, uh, creative director, off-white, very famous brand. And I went in there and he just looked at me. And it's just like the first thing he says to me, he's like, hey, you don't work for Booking.com, right? which Booking.com booking <laughs> was right next to it, you know, this big uh, yep. hotel uh, company. And I'm like, no, I don't work for Booking.com. I work for this, you know, my own company on the side. And then he got like super interested. And ever since then, like we, we've been in touch. Like I don't see him anymore at the coffee shop, but I see him all over the streets and he always comes back to me and always at, talking about fashion side. So it's a, it's a way to co mm, uh, interesting. Uh, connect between people. And I remember walking down the street as well. People were looking I've never felt that way. And since then, I also realized that when somebody's wearing something high fashion or something that really stands out, people take notice. So people do really connect to each other through fashion, which is powerful. Hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, 
door opener, a conversation yeah. starter, yeah. and it's a way to non-verbally communicate shared interests and values, absolutely. That's a nice way to word it. Um, and I want to talk a little bit more about communities, in particular digital communities. And of course, there's as many different types of digital communities as there are platforms, and, and, and in fact, probably many more so. But what what's the digital equivalent of that story you just told, right? I, mm. I join a Discord server that I've never been on before, and my avatar tells a story. What does that do inside of that community? Or I jump into a metaversal world, into a, into a hypothetical Roblox world or a hypothetical Zepetto world, and my avatar looks a certain way. How do you guys think about these, the, the opportunities to kind of digitally open doors inside of communities with the fashion that your avatar or your PFP is, is, is sporting? Does it, are there, can it do things in a digital world that it can't do in a physical world? Can community development and community building be facilitated because of digital fashion in a way that it, 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 it can't in the physical world? Wow, that's a, that's a, a very uh, deep question, and we're probably going <laughs> really hard into psychology, which is not my my strongest topic. But I do have a big opinion about this, though, and it's something that we're super passionate about at the Fabricant. Community building is one of the most important things for every single company in the future, and the Web three space has proven that. We've seen it with uh, Board Apes. You know, everybody's, why does anybody pay hundreds of thousands of dollars for uh, a JPEG of, of a monkey? Uh, and that's the, qu the answer there is, it, it's the community that's around it. They want to be part of that community. Now, how, is, is digital doing really anything different that doesn't exist in the real life? I think the psychology probably is the same. It's just the experience that's different. Because you don't you don't see like these 10k uh, PFP projects in real life. You don't have like 10,000 paintings of a real paintings of an ape, and you know everybody comes and buys that. You know, so so I think the psychology is the same. The the experience is, is very different, and I think what it comes down to, like what what is what are the most important things about any community? I think it's the values that you set. You know, like what, what do you want to achieve with that community? What do you want to achieve together as a, as a community? What is that experience? Uh, you know, so like if we talk about the values of the fabricant, um, we're doing digital fashion. We shouldn't take it serious. We want to have fun. There's got to be a fun side of it. Uh, it we, we want it to be collaborative. We want to collaborate with the whole world. And we want to ensure that when the fabricant profits, our community profits as well. And we talk a lot about mm -hmm. empathy, you know, like we, we really want to be empathetic towards each other and really just make it something uh, where, where we connect and help each other out. Because that, that to me is the strength of these digital communities. They're not based on where you are ge geographically. They're based on what your interest is. And you can connect anywhere in the world, whatever time zone you're in. And you can be always mm -hmm. connected to the community itself. It's, it's a new way of operating. Uh, for, for instance, the challenge for us is we have a Discord running. Uh, there's more than 6,000 people on the Discord from all different time zones. But we only have moderators in, in Mexico, in Japan, and in Europe. You know, so that, that, mm -hmm. that doesn't, doesn't take every time zone into consideration. Yep. And, but they're also only working uh, maybe, you know, six to eight hours a day. You know, so we need to cater for all hours, like 24-7 throughout the whole week. So we need like 13 more moderators who's constantly upkeeping that community, constantly engaging with the community. So it becomes a 24-7 a tank station where you constantly, whenever you have a need, you need to be able to go there and connect, it, connect with the community itself. And then, you know, why do you, why do you go there in, in the first place? Yeah, that, that's the kind of the, the magic question. What we want to achieve for the fabricant is a, a safe space. One, one is to onboard, let's say, the Web2 community into a Web3 space. A lot, a lot of the people from our platform, they minted their first NFT ever. We, we want to educate them that NFTs are not bad. Uh, they can be done in a good way. It's not all about flipping money. You know, there's, there's a much, much higher purpose uh, to it. 
you know, so it's a lot about uh, a lot about education, supporting each other, uh, making money out of it as well. You know, it is an ecosystem where you should be able to make a living out of it too. Very important. Uh, but most of all, it's it's a it's a place where you come and hang out. You know, where you learn something, mm. where you have a curious growth mindset to try and do something. Uh, you know, good in the world through digital only fashion. So digital fashion is a tool that connects people and communities. That that's the way we see it. But the, I, honestly, I think there's so many different answers to it, and so much like interesting stuff that we're seeing uh, coming through, kind of like the PFP world right now. So I want to get a little bit more into the Web three and community stuff in just a second. But before I do, I I want to go back. Just as you did, I want to share a real life story and just sort of see if that real life story speaks to you in any way, shape or form, either as a good thing or a bad thing, because I'm not actually sure. I'm not sure how how you'll react to it. Um, are you familiar with uh, Tough Mudder? Have you ever heard that name, Tough Mudder? Tough Mudder? Tough Mudder? Never heard of Tough Mudder. So Tough is Mudder a Canadian is thing? an ex... And it's, it's international. Okay. It's an extreme physical obstacle course thing oh, that good. you do. You sign up and you join yeah, a, 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 a group who compete. You can do it as an individual or you can do it as a team. And they have these Tough Mudder events that go around the world, or at least they did before COVID. And it's a race. And you race sort of like more for your, your, your personal satisfaction. You, I mean, maybe some people aim to kind of win, but you're, individually, it's more, can I finish this? Yeah. And by the time it's done, you're exhausted, you're covered in mud, you've probably pushed yourself to the physical limits, you know, whatever that you didn't know were, were possible. And only once you've finished, are you allowed to buy Tough Mudder gear. So if you see someone walking down the street wearing a Tough Mudder hat, chances are they've actually completed a Tough Mudder. They're not just a fan of the brand. They've actually gone through the exercise and done the, the thing. And so if you're also wearing a Tough Mudder hat, there's a real nod there, not just we're into the same stuff, but we've lived through something that nobody else here has lived through, right? It, 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 it's, it's a kind of secret handshake about the sort of experience that you've lived through. So how does that sit with you? Is that awesome or is that not awesome. <laughs> does that, does that exist in the digital world yet? Should it exist in the digital world? Is that somehow maybe elitist and less sort of democratized? Uh, yeah. I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about that story and how does that resonate with you? Cool. Maybe you can create the digital Tough Mudder uh, game with Rowie. <laughs> um, yeah. No, I, I know exactly what you mean. So we, ha we have it here in Europe as well. Uh, here we call it the Mutt Masters. Uh, di different name. Okay. I did, I, I've never heard of Tough Mudder, but I do see everybody with these Mutt Masters uh, T-shirts, and I and I know the okay. concept. Um, and it's the same thing. Like Iron Man kind of has that same type of vibe. Uh, I mean, you can you can buy the Iron Man gear without actually you know doing the race, but you do get like very unique Iron Man stuff mm -hmm. to show like, hey, look at me. I'm a half an Iron Man or I'm a full Iron Man. Mm -hmm. So this concept does exist in multiple different places. Now, what what is the the digital version of that, um, I, I think, I think all of the PFP projects. So if you think about a, a ten thousand, you know, PFP mm -hmm. project, and every, you know everybody who's bought it, you know that they're part of that clan, they're part of that community. You know, it, it's scarcity. It is kind of like a gentleman's club, as as you call it. It 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 is a club, and it and it's the way to flex. You know, as as we call it, it's the way to show that hey, you're part of this. You've done this, and other people haven't. That that exists in the fashion world very very strongly, mm. and that's why a lot of uh, let's say rich kids or rich people they will very quickly buy um, luxury clothing simply for that aspect because it's a way to show like hey, I have this, you don't. Hey, I, I, I have the means to, to buy this. Uh, you don't. Um, I, I've seen it in some of the fashion experiences where some 12 year old kid comes to the, comes to the, to the store, you know, they have bodyguards with them. They just like point at a few things and within five minutes, they've bought $12,000 worth of gear, you know, and then they have all the clothing that probably their friends don't. And, you know, again, it's about that exclusivity. It's about that, hey, mm -hmm. look at me, I'm different. And it's the easiest way to prove that, 
you know that and that's what i was you know saying about a fashion victim somebody who just buys some clothing just to be different from others but it only makes them more insecure because they think that the clothing itself should be a, a way to flex yourself it's a way to showcase yourself when it you know it's something maybe a little bit more a little bit more internal but so and i agree with everything that you've just said and i i'm looking more for value judgment and perhaps maybe you don't want to maybe you don't want to pass judgment on it but it does feel to me like it's hard to argue that that system of fashion as a as a vehicle to flex is aligned with the idea of the democratization of being a fashionista which sort of sounds like it's kind of what you guys are trying to achieve a little bit more of this idea that anyone in the digital world can be a fashionista that does seem to my mind and to my ears to clash a little bit with this idea of you know only the exclusive privileged few can have access to this so i i guess what i'm wondering is kind of which which ones of those are you aiming for are, are 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 you are you supporting team exclusivity or are you supporting team democratization or maybe it's some sort of hybrid in between it's probably the hybrid in between but I'll, uh, let, let, let's just take it like this uh, we're definitely you know for the democratization you know part of our manifesto yep. is like anybody anywhere in the world can be the next virtual applaud the next Karl Lagerfeld the next Coco yep. Chanel Got it. you know you don't have to be in Paris for this that and the tool will help you but you know simply because the tool is there doesn't mean that everybody's going to be that you know simply because mm-hmm. everybody has a smartphone doesn't make them great photographers or great storytellers or great videographers you do still need that you know specific unique way of being spark. yeah spark that personality i think personality is super important to really show yourself you know like really just come like hey this is my unique story and i'm super proud of it and you know the whole world needs to know about it some people just kind of have that uniqueness to them and that can really be themselves and they know how to use these tools in in, in their own advantage you know so just because we're really focused on the democratization you know it still has all the same mechanics in place you know it, the way we're going to be people make people care about it it's it's got to have a level of scarcity it's got to have a level of yep. community it it's got to have this feeling that not everybody can get that and you know that's what the tool needs to enable so okay. the hybrid the okay. hybrid is probably it. your answer right there right there we go that's fine and i don't disagree i don't disagree because there is something exciting about that exclusivity um but there's also something exciting about that idea of bringing the creativity to the masses and bringing the potential to belong to the masses in a way that it frankly doesn't do with a you know whatever $3000 Louis Vuitton bag like i just will never belong to that club ever in my entire life and you know so there's something interesting about trying to find a hybrid between the two looking to the future a little bit and you know here you can put on your 5 year cap you can put on your 10 year cap it doesn't matter it's all just theory crafting anyway so there is no wrong answer you know when we when we hear when we hear people talk about the quote unquote metaverse uh there's a variety of different you know explanations for it or visions for it or definitions of it uh and then we hear a lot of people talking about how we already have metaverses today right we have these proto metaverses Roblox decentralized the sandbox you know etc cetera, etc cetera. these are i guess you could call them proto metaverses or metaverse candidates or something like that and uh i'm wondering what your personal thoughts are regarding the sort of question of interoperability right if i have this in- this incredibly cool shirt that i've designed in the fabricant and we're 5 years in the future how important is it do you think to uh a, a consumer that they can wear that exact same shirt across any platform they participate in uh, you know are they going to be playing decentraland and the sandbox at the same time are they going to want that shirt that they've designed to be expressed inside of the sandbox and inside of the fabric uh, inside decentraland or you know is that something that the technologists are desperately trying to solve but that at a consumer level i'm going to have my platform of choice i'm going to have my friends list i'm going to have my you know my my bubble 
And I really want to make sure that my, my self-expression is strong inside that bubble, but that outside of that bubble, it, it, it matters a little bit less to me. So are you, again, <laughs> which side are you on? Do you think it, it, we need a future of fully interoperability? Do you imagine that for the fabricant to truly succeed in your goals and your missions, true interoperability needs to be achieved? Or do you think more, you know, whatever, um, bubbles uh, will, will exist even in this hypothetical future? Sure. I think that's a rhetorical question. I, I, I think there's only one answer to this. And uh, l- l- let me try it back into our real lives. Now, if I buy a sweater, let's say the black sweater that I'm you know, wearing, do I want to wear it everywhere where I want to go to? Or can I only wear it to one place at a time? Or do I have to buy a black sweater to the club and a black sweater to the restaurant and a black sweater to the supermarket? Do I do I need the same item for all of these different experiences? Uh, we're gonna maybe people just don't know it yet, but of course we want that one item to be worn everywhere. And again, the the whole question around NFTs and ownership, uh, I, I think it's the most valid one because I I think it's blasphemous the fact that I buy an item in a game but then the game disappears and that item disappears as well you know and it's the same like let's say let's say I buy a Tesla car and Tesla you know says like oh actually we're bankrupt we're going to quit and then you know they're going to take my car away with it as well you know, that, that 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 idea is just like it's not logical in our in our real lives so why is it so logical in in our virtual lives of course I want ownership. Like I put money into this item. I want I want to wear it everywhere. I want as much use cases as possible because I've paid money for this item. I own this item. But that just that form just doesn't exist right now. Somehow as consumers, we just accept it. That it was like, oh, the game disappeared. You know, I put hundreds of dollars into it. Uh, you know, gone it is. Yeah. So mm. for for me, the interoperability is a must. It, it, it's uh, like it's it's part of the future. How it happens, whether it's technical magic or whether it's just optimizing the same item for multiple different games, doesn't really matter. It just it just needs to happen. And the way we're handling it with the fabricant right now, we have the high quality Unreal Engine item, but then we have the low quality Decentraland item. Then we have the low quality Sandbox mm-hmm. item. You know, then we have, you know, the JPEG, then we have the video. So we just optimize it for different environments. The challenge there is the scalability right now. How do you scale that? You know, you can do it technically or you can try, you know, I'm sure every gaming company would have it by now if it was possible. And everybody's still talking about, yeah, we're going to be the bridge for interoperability. Well, you know, I'm, I'm waiting for it too. But I think it actually the scalability is going to come from the community, uh, community engagement, uh, creating that ecosystem where you're going to actually have the community build these items themselves. You're going to have the AR filter creators. You're going to have the Decentraland item creators. I don't, I don't think that traditional form of a company works anymore where, you know, if you want to scale your item optimization that you need to hire more people. Uh, you know, that's, the, let's say, the... The traditional way of working. I think we're really mo- moving more towards this community engagement and community involvement to to get everybody to take ownership of the process and the assets themselves. Does that answer mm-hmm. your question? No, it absolutely does. And and maybe maybe we can just get like super nerdy for a second and talk a little bit about the details of how that can work. And it, again, it can be it can be a hypothetical future. But I'm using the fabricant, and I have this beautiful tool. And these beautiful fabrics and this beautiful, you know, stitching and quality materials and patterns. And I create slash remix this, this, this outfit or this item of clothing. And I say, look, this is amazing. I'm, I'm a creative genius. I mint it. I, I own it. It's mine now. What's the vehicle for the Snapchat filter creator? to make an AR version of that? What's the vehicle? I mean, if we take something relatively simple, like, you know, whatever, uh, sandbox, you know, or, or Decentraland, you, as you said, it can, it can probably be done technically, it can probably be done prog- programmatically, but it, there's probably no technical solution I can think of today to take, um, you know, whatever, the, the high res unreal powered version of the item in the fabricant and output it to, 
uh, you know, Fortnite or something like that, whereby, again, it is still unreal, but it's at a much, much lower polygon count and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. That would probably need manpower right now in order to do that. Correct. But maybe I don't know how to use Unreal, right? So I, I, I can't create the Fortnite equivalent of that skin. I designed the item inside of the fabricant, but I don't know how to necessarily bring it to any of these other platforms. How are you imagining a world whereby I can design it once and the community can help me bring it to all the different platforms? Great question. This is a, a passion topic uh, in, a, in a sense that we're not building the tool because, like you say, the future needs to be, I designed this digital fashion item and now I want to wear it in this environment. Now I want to wear it in this one. Yep. You know, like you you literally need that kind of like one click bridge to what, whatever environment yep. you want to use it in. Now, to me, the answer right now, let, let's just say five years in the future, you know, we have, you, we have those technical bridges and, you know, they exist. But let's just say right now, it is the community involvement. It's, when we when we say that we want our community to profit from participation in our community, we mean it. And the way we're going to do this is we're laying the foundation. We're giving you the tool to create your digital only fashion item. Now you might not be a creator. You might not know how to you know create items for Unreal Engine or, or AR filters, but we have the community for it. And you can basically by participating in our ecosystem. You can use the token itself to to get somebody to create that AR filter for you to get to Got it. to get that optimization for you for this other environment. And there's fantastic builders that you know, like Decentraland and Sandbox. They have great teams behind them who are really helping out to scale these. Uh, for instance, um, World of Women, which is another PFP project, mm -hmm. um, they have ten thousand items. Now every single World of Women is in uh, Sandbox right now. They've created all of those items. They did all of that work. Now, the question is like, oh, what happens when millions of items need to be on this platform? That's when it gets uh, a little bit more difficult, but there's a lot of uh, work being done for auto automation. You know, we always talk about, starts with manual labor, then you have an optimized process, and then you have a semi-automated process, and then you finish off with that automated process. And the question is like, how much can you automate how much can you semi-automate? How much can you optimize? And what what still needs to be manual labor? And when when the when the answer is manual labor, it has to be community driven because you can't be hiring mm -hmm. thousand AR filter artists uh, tomorrow. Yeah. But you can engage a community to come together who who want to be those creators. So that's why you know like we had the conversation around community earlier on. You know those communities become super important. So you actually get the right people on board. You get the right right people with the right incentives to be part of that community because we see a lot of dirty PFP project communities as well where it's all about yeah, flipping sure. money you know like there's so many scams and you know it's really giving a bad name to the space but there's you know some amazing communities as well and I think we need to give them a little bit more uh, uh, love and respect as well celebrate them a little celebrate bit more. them yeah absolutely because the focus is so much on the scams at the moment okay uh well listen uh I think that's a, a a very powerful point. Um, and, uh, frankly, it, it brings me to the end of the questions that I had planned to ask. Uh, we're sitting at a little over an hour of recorded conversations so far, but, um, I, I, I always end these podcasts the same way. Uh, asking you is, is there an angle that you thought we were going to explore? I mean, frankly, is there something more you want to add? Is there something you thought we were going to talk about? that the conversation today didn't go towards? And if so, I'd, I'd, I'd love to use whatever time remains to us to have that conversation. Mm, yeah, good question. I, I, I think you brought a lot of extra dimension in, into the conversation. So, uh, questions that I you know, haven't seen be so well <laughs> thought through uh, before. Different angles and different ways of looking at it. So I you know, really appreciate that. And no, another, yeah, another angle, can I think of another angle? Uh, n not off the top of my mind right now. I think uh, Great. interoperability, identity, those are the two biggest things that, you know, w that is really going to make digital fashion uh, uh, ma massive. You know, like it's the, it's the mm -hmm. bottlenecks that, w that we're really seeing. One is, yeah, interoperability, utility. We, we talk a lot about utility, giving people the use cases. And the other one yeah. is to give, you know, people the, the, the meaning the want because nobody's 
waking up in the morning right now and be like, well, what am I going to wear digitally today? It just doesn't right. exist yet. Yep. You know, that habit is yep. not there. So we need to create that experience to make that habit come alive, to make people to yep. want to care about that. But the main question there is, how do we not just create more noise in people's lives? Uh, yeah. You know, like we, we need to work. be, yeah, we need to be very mindful of that as well, that, hey, you know, this, this might just create, uh, you know, just extra layers in our lives that we don't truly need. Uh, you know, so there needs mm -hmm. to be an educational side on how, how to provide value. And I think the biggest value is to truly for people to start thinking about their identities in a much richer way than they are already doing right now. So, you know, this, this is my uh, ask for you, Ben, and uh, all the listeners to start thinking about how clothing is, uh, yeah, just kind of making their lives uh, how it is right now. Uh, what would it mean to actually do something different? And it starts with small steps and uh, and that the, the digital environment is a, is a great place for that. And another question I have for you, Ben, ha, ha, did you mint your digital fashion items at the Fabric and Studio yet? I didn't get an acceptance into the first season. Oh, shit. So that's my bad. So I have to. Okay. Then I will make sure that you're in the next season. <laughs> 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 I'm waiting for season two. I'm checking my email thread. I'm just waiting to get that invite accepted. I, um, Have you applied? Yeah. I've, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh. I applied before you and I even started talking. Oh, no way. And you didn't get access to season one? No, yeah, but I mean, yeah. It, okay. I, I, need, I need to make sure that you're part of the next season because I... I I'd yeah, love to play with it. I definitely want to see the digital fashion you create. And then I want to see yep. you wearing it virtually. Deal. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> I absolutely will. Okay. And and if we ever do a follow-up podcast, I'll I'll try and get it set up so that I'm wearing it as an AR filter. If I can find someone to do it for me, I'll get an AR filter of my shirt on top of me and I'll use Snapca Snapchat camera and then you can see me wearing my digital shirt while we do the second episode. Ac actually, I will tell you, I'm 100% sure that you will be able to wear fabric and swag the next time we speak virtually. 100% sure. All right. Because I know what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> That's exciting. Um, all right, everyone, listen. So as you can see, Carrie and I, we can talk for hours. In fact, we already have talked for hours because we talked for a full hour or so before we even recorded this podcast. Sure, sure. Um, we, we share a lot of, I would say, uh, thoughts and hopes and dreams about uh, digital identity, about the role of uh, fashion uh, in these persistent Proto Metaversal Worlds. Um, if you haven't checked it out, do take a look at what the Fabricant is doing. It's, it's really interesting stuff. Uh, they have a really active uh, Discord, as Carrie mentioned. They're, they've got a pretty exciting Twitter community that you can follow. Obviously, uh, there is a tool that you can, if he lets you, if you get into <laughs> season two, that you can download and that you can play with. Um, it is a, it is a web three enabled product. Um, and if, if you haven't yet cut your teeth on web three, um, this could be the one, this could be the one that, that motivates you to do it. So take a look, uh, at, at the fabricant and their offerings and, uh, anxious to hear what you think about it. Uh, you know how to reach me, email, Twitter, all that good stuff. Uh, in the meantime, Carrie, all the best to you and your team this year. I'm sure it's going to be a very busy one and a very exciting one. And thank you so much for being on the podcast. Yeah. And thank you so much for having me and having some really, really great questions. I really enjoyed this conversation. Awesome. Have a good one. Thank you. You too. And that's it for another episode of the Tomorrow with Rovio podcast. I hope you enjoyed the interview today with Carrie Murphy, CEO and founder of The Fabricant. We talked about a lot of really interesting things that touch upon themes that we've been exploring on this podcast for the last couple of years. User-generated content, avatar, self-expression, the metaverse, Web3, digital ownership, um, lots of really interesting themes here all converging into the space that the Fabricant is working in. So hopefully you found that interesting and, and insightful. As always, please don't hesitate to reach out if you have any thoughts about future themes or guests that you'd like us to explore on this podcast. And of course, thank you very much for listening. Have a wonderful day. Talk to you soon. Bye.